So as you may have noticed from the lecture, that's uh, that's material that just doesn't work on slides. I think a lot of that stuff. If I had in you know in person, I could have two screens, one with the slides and one with this stuff. It's hard to talk about this stuff without a couple of slides, though. So maybe you can pull up the videos in two different tabs and flip back and forth. Uh, so I want to talk about the actual use of these triggers and constraints, um, and uh, also on the effects of these foreign key policies. So just like the last one of these demo videos, I've split up. I'm going to post one big file of this stuff for you to play with. But for this, these purposes, I've split it up into two things. I've got this big script that adds all the data and creates a bunch of triggers. Um, and we'll come back to that in a few minutes. Uh, but for the time being, I'm going to run the whole thing. So I'll do Alt-X, and that just runs everything. There we go. Um, and then we'll go over here. And let's, uh, before talking about anything else, let's talk a bit about these foreign key constraints uh, and just polishing off what these on delete and on update policies actually mean. Uh, so um, there's our products table. And uh, if I select from order contents, I will observe, for example, that there are uh, orders that use product ID number two. It's these two things. Uh, we can see that uh, in the order contents, so I've just copied and pasted the, uh, the creation statement for the order contents table here. In the order contents table, the uh, foreign key product ID, so that is to say the entry in this column here, is always in the products table as product ID. So it must be a real product. I can't add something to the order contents table. Let's try that out. Um, I'm not allowed to add something to the order contents table unless the insert into order contents the values, I don't know, let's add to order 1000, product number 99, and we'll add 0 0.1 kilograms of it. If I try and run this, I'm told, I'm sorry, foreign key constraint violated. The product you give has to be a real product. Okay, so that's a good constraint to have, great. Um, now, uh, product ID number two. Um, it appears at least twice in the order contents table. What happens if I try and delete it? So uh, let's begin by just verifying we can delete stuff. Delete from products where product ID equals one. And before I do that, let's remind ourselves there is a product with ID one. Let's try this. It succeeds. So no problems. I don't see an error. I run this. Product ID one is missing. So I am allowed to delete from the products table. That's absolutely fine. What if I try and delete product ID two? And I'm told, sorry, can't do it. Uh, in, the, in the last one of these demo videos, you saw me try do this again before forgetting that I hadn't taught that, that we hadn't gotten to that point yet. Um, so in this case, the order contents table is telling the database, I'm sorry, I need product ID 2. You, you can't delete it from the products table because that would, vi that would result in a foreign key violation. I need these rows that contain product ID 2 to stay there and I need them to continue to have product ID 2. So in this case, um, the restrict policy just says the deletion fails. And we'll notice, I ran, I'll run it again to make sure we know, see, it's definitely failing. Um, I tried to delete product ID 2, and I'll notice it's still there. So the restriction happened inside of the order contents foreign key, but the database completely voided the outcome of this delete operation. Okay, let's try an update statement. So update products uh, set product ID equals 100 where product ID equals two. So the update policy is in my order contents table, which you'll notice still has those two rows with, order, with product ID two. Uh, in my order contents table, the policy, if I update a product ID, and remember that these policies apply to deletes and updates in the products table, if I update a product ID, that update should cascade into the order contents table. So we'll try that. I run that, it succeeds. I go to my order contents table, and now these two values, uh, I have product ID 100. It cascaded into the order contents table. So key outcome here. First, this on delete restrict doesn't prevent deletions from the products table in all cases, only in cases where the order contents table needs them for something. So only um, elements of the products table that actually appear in order contents are restricted from deletion. The cascade criteria, of course, applies to updates to the products table, not updates to the order contents table. I'm going to get rid of this. I'm actually going to go rerun my um, schema creation. And that will set everything back to the way it was. Great. Okay, so I have product ID 1 and product ID 2 again. 
Um, let's just verify that. So I want to say delete from order contents where product ID equals two. So just to remember, we've got two rows in here where product ID equals two. I'm going to delete them from order contents. So I mentioned in that in that one line on the slide that I that I aggressively drew a square around, a rectangle around. I said this is the biggest problem people have on exams with this, with the foreign key on update on delete policies. It says on delete restrict. So am I allowed to delete this row from the order contents table? And the answer is absolutely. This is on a deletion from the products table. It says nothing about the order contents table. This policy does not restrict my ability to modify the order contents table. Maybe some other table has a foreign key into order contents. That might be a problem. But these policies do not um, affect my ability to modify order contents. So we'll verify that product ID 2 is now gone. Now furthermore, we saw a minute ago, I'm not allowed to delete product ID 2 from products because it gave an error. Uh, the error was I need this. But I am now allowed to do that. I've deleted all occurrences of product ID 2 from order contents. So that, that restriction no longer applies. I can now delete from products. Um, let's take a look at the uh, order number cascading and um, uh, set null policies. So we'll rerun the schema. There we go. Uh, and we'll just make sure we know everything's back to normal here. And I'm going to add also select star from orders. There are my orders. So this says. If, so the order contents table refer, it contains an order number, and we know that it always has to be a valid order. Um, that's the point of a foreign key. I'm not allowed to associate something with order 9999 unless it actually is an order in the order, in the orders table. So the policy on the order number here is if I ever, whoops, if I ever delete the order number from the orders table, set any occurrence of that order number in the order contents table. So on delete from the table being referred to by the foreign key, that's orders, set the foreign key in the order contents table to null. So let's try that. Um, we'll verify here that in my order number, in my order contents table, there are three things that refer to order 1001. Let's delete from orders where order number equals 1001. Now in the products case, the restrict policy would say I'm not allowed to do this. But in order numbers, it says set null. Um, so I delete this, and then I get this interesting error. So the slide points this out as well, which is that actually the deletion in the order t orders table is not is being prevented, but not by a restrict policy. It's being prevented by this annoying thing. And I'll, um, we'll see another example in a, f in a couple of lectures where we can use this to greater effect. The set null can't really be applied here because um, you can't set order num to null in the order contents table because it's part of a primary key. But it's trying to. You can see it's trying to, it says violates the not null constraint. It's trying to set that order number to be null. It just can't because it can't set a primary key column to null. So that's a bit of a non-starter. Let's take a look at the update on update cascade. So we'll do update orders set um, order number equals 9999 where order number equals 1000. I run that, I go looking at order contents, and I will observe that now that one row for order 1000 is for order 9999. So the key thing to remember for these policies is that on delete and on update refer to deletions and updates in the table being referred to, the one being referenced by my foreign key. They refer to how does a delete on this table impact the table that I'm creating that, can, that has the foreign key defined on it. Um, and so look, enjoy the exam question on July 13th about this. Uh, okay, so we've done that. Let's talk more about triggers and trigger co and constraint triggers. So I'll just get rid of this. I'm going to rerun my schema creation again. And then let's take some time to just look over it here. I'm going to make this a bit shorter. Okay, so at the top, I drop all of my tables if they exist. I also drop all of my functions if they exist so that I can create them again when I rerun. There's my products table. I've got a check constraint to make sure that price per kilogram is between 0 and 100, and the name is non-empty. Um, actually, let's try that. So let's do insert into products the values. Okay, so what do I want to do? I want to go um, ID, name, and price. Okay, so my ID will be 99 just because that... Um, and then uh, we'll say at a guava, and we will have that with price 10.5. This is this is just to make sure we can we can do insertions. Looks good. And then I'll do my select star from products to make sure that all worked. Great. I've got a brand new product. Let's reset everything. 
Uh, and let's see what happens if I try and violate these constraints. First one, what if I make this an empty string? I do the insertion. It says can't do it. It violates this constraint product name check, um, which would be the automatically generated name for this thing. Um, so this check constraint says the length of the name attribute has to be greater than zero. And this, of course, is an empty string with length zero. Interestingly, I am allowed to make a product whose um, uh, name is, is a bunch of spaces. That's allowed because that's a string of length greater than zero. You can look into, there's pretty easy ways of enforcing a constraint that it has to contain at least one non-space character as well using some of Postgres's string functions. So we'll get rid of that. Um, let's try violating the price per kilogram constraint. So we'll go back, okay, and we'll say, what if I set the price to be negative? Then it fails because obviously prices can't be negative. What if I try and set the price to be something extremely high? You'll notice that the constraint uh, is also that the price is less than 100. So if I try that, I can expect the constraint to also fail. So the insertion is denied. I, the insertion never occurred. Okay, so we'll take a look at the rest of the schema. I'll just rerun it for safety here. Um, we've got check constraints on products. We've got check constraints on um, orders. Uh, I'm not going to try and violate these, although it's an interesting exercise to try out. If you, if you try and throw in an order date that's um, uh, in the future, it'll fail. Um, same issue with the, with the uh, customer name as with the product name. We require the length to be greater than zero. Here's the order contents table. We'll notice that there's no constraints defined on it. I think we probably do, maybe we should have added a check constraint that makes sure that this value is greater than zero. You can't buy a negative number of kilograms. There is no need to place constraints on these with check constraints because the foreign key constraints constrain them. So order number has to be greater than or equal to zero because order number here refers to the order number in the orders table where there's a check constraint making it greater than or equal to zero. So it, it turns out, I mean, the constraints sort of um, cascade through the same way modifications or anything else would with these foreign keys. So we have the, we've tried out check constraints. They're lots of fun, but I don't, I'm not gonna belabor that. You can try them out too. Um, let's take a look at these, uh, these triggers we defined earlier. So here is an after trigger. We can see I create a trigger. This is the name of the constraint itself. And here's the trigger function. The trigger runs after insert or update. You can also define triggers that run after deletions or um, after insertions, updates, or deletions, or before deletions. Um, after insert or update on order contents. And uh, the trigger itself, um, when you start a trigger that's running after an insertion or an update, you get a variable called new. And new is the row that's a, where we've, that we've just inserted or updated. And remember that this is running after the insertion. So if I wanna prevent orders from having more than three items, this is after an insertion of an item. And I might wanna undo that insertion. So if I'm gonna check how many things, the, I'm gonna look at only this order. I don't actually have to. I could look at the size of every order and raise an exception if any of them are too big. But I could notice that the only time an order is gonna be too big is right after I've added the first item to make it too big. If I add the fourth item to an order and then I reject that insertion, no order will ever be too big. So I look at the order number in the new row that I just added. I count the number of things in that order. If it's greater than three, then the new row I just added wasn't supposed to be added after all, so I throw this exception. Um, otherwise, I just return the new row. And of course, with the constraint trigger methodology, when you're using an after constraint, if we return the new row without raising an exception, then the insertion uh, succeeds, it goes forward. Okay, here's this trigger I defined in the slides that uh, also runs after the insertion or update. And it takes a look at the row you've just modified or inserted, and it says if that product ID is the ID of a pineapple, so just it just uses the database to figure out the ID of a pineapple. If it's that, throw an exception, sorry, can't do it. Otherwise, let, it, let the um, product be added. And then there's the constraint for it. Uh, and then we've got a couple of these. And so I wanna go over and try these out, but we'll just go through all of them first. So uh, I have this constraint that is, uh, sorry, a trigger. It's not a constraint, it's just a trigger. It's just a function that runs every time I do an insertion. So before, not after, before an insertion to order contents, run this function. So because this is happening before, any modification I make to the new row will modify what gets inserted, if something gets inserted. Now, if I throw an exception here, it'll still, the, the insertion will fail, but I don't throw an exception. Instead, I say, were you trying to insert the product whose ID is the same as, uh, whose ID goes with the name Apple? If so, change the product ID of the row to be pair, and then insert it, continue the insertion. So no matter how you, any attempt you make to add a product with ID 
with the ID for Apple with an insert statement will fail, well, not fail, it'll just result in you ordering a pair instead. Now it's interesting because this trigger only gets run before insertions, there are still ways of preventing, uh, of, of getting an Apple in there. You could use an update statement to do that and maybe we'll try that in a minute. And here's a before trigger where if I try and add the same product more than once, it just ignores the second or third or fourth or whatever time. When you re return null from a before trigger, the, um, the row you were trying to insert just gets discarded. And here's the data, the normal data. So we'll go over here and take, try some of these insertions. Okay, so here, the, um, if I do select star from products, the ID of pineapple is six. So let's try adding uh, uh, the product called pineapple to uh, the order contents table. We'll try this and it refuses. It even gives us back the exception that we programmed in. Pineapples are not permitted. And if I go look at order contents, this was adding it to order 1000. If I select star from order contents, I will notice that order 1000 does not contain any extra items. So this insertion did not succeed. Nothing happened. Um, order 1003 already has three items in it. Let's try adding a uh, fourth item. Now, it's worth considering, you should try this on your own, that just because these things make the constraints fail doesn't necessarily mean that the constraints work. I mean, maybe the constraints fail for every insertion. Now, in this case, you, you might have seen, I actually did a whole bunch of insertions that did succeed, so the constraints don't apparently fail in all cases. But it's worth considering, just because it doesn't work in the case that it's not supposed to work doesn't mean it does work in the case it is. Um, so I'll run this, and it'll say, sorry, order's too big. And I was trying to add product two to order 1003. And if I go look at the order contents table, product number two isn't there. The insertion failed and so it didn't occur. Okay, so um, if I look at my products table, ID number one is Apple. Let's try adding an Apple to an order. We'll try adding Apple to order 1000. Now I do this um, and it, it works fine. It, it seems to do the insertion. But if I go looking at order 1000, I will notice down here, it contains product ID 2, which is a pear, not an apple. So, yeah, in case you want proof. Uh, and so my trigger was run on this row. It decided that the row needed to be modified, and then it modified it. And the modification happened completely silently. Um, let's query the products table. So yeah, here's the result of looking at all the products. ID 1 is apple. Let's try inserting another product with ID 1. Now, if you delete the trigger or you try this insertion on any other version of the fruit data set, it will give an error. It'll say you can't insert another thing with ID 1 because there's a primary key violation. Here, I can just run this over and over again, and it appears, it says updated rows equals zero, but it doesn't give an error. Um, and if I go looking at the products table, nothing happened because the trigger intercepted this and just discarded it silently which is odd, but there are some cases where you might want to do that. Now, one common case is um, you want to take any insertion that's a duplicate and mutate it into an update operation. Uh, and there are ways of making a trigger so that if you attempt to do a duplicate insertion, um, for example, actually we could try that out. So let's try a couple of um, modifications to this. Uh, so one, actually I want to first, um, if we're going to be playing with the schema a bit, I want to first figure out if I'm not allowed to add apples to an order. So I already saw that when I tried to add an apple to order 1000, it got intercepted and I added a pair instead. And maybe you can believe uh, any other order I try that with, I'm going to have the same problem. Um, but let's try this. Uh, the trigger that I was running, I'm going to update order contents. I'm going to set uh, product ID to be equal to one, which is apple, where the order number equals 1000 and product ID is currently equal to 2. So what I'm doing here is I'm trying to find this specific row, order 1000 product 2, and update it where for the product ID to be 1, so Apple. Let's try running that. We run that, it succeeds, and let's take a look at our order contents table. And we can see order 1000 actually now does contain an Apple. It contains product ID 1. And that's because my trigger was able to intercept the insertion, but my trigger wasn't able to intercept the update because, I mean, it's sort of obvious that the trigger runs before insert. It doesn't run before update. Let's try a couple of things here. Let's do before insert or update. Let's just see if we can broaden our trigger. So I'm going to run this. Oh, whoops, sorry. Um, it already exists. I'm going to rerun the entire schema creation. Okay, so I do that. Let's take a look at our order contents table. It should be back to normal now. Order 1000 just contains the one item. 
and then our products, product ID one is still apple, okay. So let's try adding an apple to the order again. So I'm gonna run the same thing that before was intercepted by my trigger. So I run that, it apparently works. I go to order contents and just like before, it turns product ID one to product ID two. Now let's see what happens if I try and change with my update product ID one to product ID two. Okay, so I do that, or sorry, I set product ID one where the product ID was previously two. Let's take a look at this, um, order contents. And here, the update didn't do anything. My trigger still ran and my trigger still caught it. And just in case you want proof of that, let's try setting product ID to be one and kilograms bought to be 100. Let's make sure that the update actually is, is, is hitting the right row. So I look for the row with order number 1000, product ID two, and I change product ID to one and kilograms bought to be um, 100. And it runs and it apparently updates a row. Let's go look at our order contents table. And there it is, product ID two. So my trigger still ran and my trigger caught that I was trying to, to backdoor in an apple into the order and it still modified the, uh, the tuple and set it to pair. But the other modification did hold. So clearly the update did catch the row that I wanted. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, the other thing is I mentioned that I can run this query over and over again and uh, this insert statement. And if I do, it gets ignored because of the nature of my um, of my trigger operation. So the trigger just says, if you try and add a product that already exists, then, um, then just uh, ignore any future one. But what if I wanted to use this as a clever way of having to never run an update statement? What if I decided, hey, when I wanna change a product, I'll just reinsert the product into the table. Now, as I said, try yourself, if you delete the trigger that I added, this will produce an error. The insert statement will produce an error because the database will say, I'm sorry, there already is a product with that ID. Maybe what I want is, to, is when I run the insert twice, I wanna change the name and um, price per kilogram to um, be whatever the new values are. I have a couple of options there. Let's try, uh, let's try maybe the, the most, um, let's try, well, no, we'll, we'll try the, the least straightforward one first. Okay, so here I am in my trigger function. I've discovered that you are trying to add a product that already exists. And I think, well, you can't do that, obviously. So I, I can't let you continue the insertion because you'll get an error. Um, in fact, why don't we see what, let's just see what happens if I do this. So I've just deleted the body of the trigger. So now the trigger just does nothing. Suppose I try and perform this insertion. It says, can't do it. There's already a product with ID one. Okay, so the trigger was definitely helping me with that. Um, so I'm at this point here. And I don't want an error to occur. So returning null means that the insertion just stops quietly. But I do want to make a modification. So why don't we just try running an update? Let's take our insertion and mutate it into an update statement. You have to be very careful that we're not, this before trigger is only before insert. If this is also before update, it'll call itself recursively, which we'd rather not have happen. So I update products and I set product ID equals new dot product ID. So I take the product ID you gave me, or sorry, I don't set that. Um, that's the where clause. Uh, I set name equals the new rows name uh, and uh, price per kilogram equals new dot price per kilogram where the product ID equals new dot product ID. So whatever product ID you gave me, the one that was duplicated, I just turn the whole thing into an update. So we'll try running this. We'll grind all the way through that. And then we'll go over here. So let's first query the products table just to make sure everything's back in working order. There it is, there's Apple with ID one. Uh, and then um, we'll just run this and see what happens. Okay, so it doesn't seem to have done anything, but let's query our products table. And we can see that it got into this if statement in the, in the trigger and it eventually just terminated the insert operation. But before doing that, it ran an update and the update modified the row in question. And so silently, I've by writing some extra code into the database, I have been able to um, merge, insert, and update operations for this table. Now in general, that's not a good idea because you like to know that the primary key is violated. But if you decide that this table, it doesn't matter, you can just keep reinserting things and that counts as an update, you now have control. You can define how people interact with your data even if they're using the standard SQL syntax. Um, I wanna do one more variation of this. Um, which is, you could also view this a bit more, um, I don't know, maybe more lazily, you could say, actually, you know what, 
the insertion's going to fail if I let it happen because the the row already has that um, the, the row already has that product ID and I can't have two of them. Why don't I just delete the row that already has the same product ID? Delete from products where product ID equals new dot product ID, and then don't return null. Just allow the insertion. So you're about to insert a row that won't be valid. So I delete the old row and then say, okay, now go ahead and insert. Let's see what happens if I try this. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna query the products table again to make sure everything's back in working condition. There it is, I've got Apple. Let's see what happens if I try running this. Uh, and it'll actually queue up an interesting subject for the next lecture as well. So I'm gonna try this. Um, so I insert into products this value here, and then I'll go to my products table and it looks like it worked just fine. Um, and uh, that's fine. So I was able to insert another apple. Well, let's, this is great. I can just use insert in lieu of update. So let's make another pair. And it'll have, it'll lower the cost. It's only $1. That's product ID 2. I'll try doing a duplicate insertion of that. And it fails for some reason. So why did that happen? Um, the reason is that, uh, and actually, maybe I should be very clear here. Let's try our old version again, just to make sure that we don't, um, that maybe it, it, it works for one but not the other. So I'll rerun this. Okay, so now we'll, we'll just, just to verify that, that there's something different between them. Okay, there's Apple and Pear. And I run this, and it updates Apple, and I run this, and it apparently updates Pear. And now if I, uh, if I look at this again, there's another Apple and another Pear. So my initial version that turned the insertion into the update and then ended the insertion, it worked. But this version that tries to turn the insertion, it says, okay, we can't insert duplicates, so delete the old copy, and then we'll let you add the new copy. So we'll run this, and we'll verify, just like before, that for some reason this doesn't work. So I do this, it works fine for Apple, but it fails for Pear. And you can see it actually is complaining about something specific. It's complaining about that deletion. So here's the issue. We saw earlier that you can't delete Pear from the products table because order contents needs it. Here, I am trying to, I'm, gonna, I'm modifying it. I, I'm changing product ID 2. I don't want there to be no product ID 2. But before I add it back, I actually try and wipe it out. So between the end of this line and the end of the insertion, so a few more lines, there is no product ID 2. And the database won't tolerate that. It says, I'm sorry, the foreign key constraint will be violated if I delete this product. So I can't do a deletion here because the constraint must be enforced uh, in, in all cases. And so that means that in this case, even if it would be only for a minute, even inside of an insert operation, the constraint would temporarily be violated. And so uh, the database can't allow that and so it rejects the operation. Now we'll see uh, in the next uh, slidey lecture, uh, we'll see that there is a way of telling the database to calm down a bit and just to give us a minute while it figures that out. Um, and, and that we can delay the enforcement uh, of certain constraints as a result. So we've seen now that we can write triggers that enforce constraints for us. We uh, see that we can write triggers that um, uh, just perform various maintenance operations. And so to be clear, I don't like this version nearly as much as I like this version, which turns an insert into an update. Uh, and the original version, which just discards the duplicate insertion. So now I have complete control over when data is inserted and updated. I can intercept it, I can reject the update, or I can make arbitrary modifications to my updates. So the next topic is, um, if I have a series of constraints and I've got a chicken and egg problem, how do I uh, resolve that? How do I allow the constraints to be temporarily suspended, but still guarantee that they all get enforced in the long run?